My name is Yelena Sokova. I'm the executive director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our webinar, uh, which is uh, focused today on the Open Skies Treaty. Um, no, we know that uh, last year was not particularly good for uh, arms control in general. And uh, the Open Skies Treaty is uh, yet one of the victims. It's still uh, in limbo at this point. Uh, the US administration has left the treaty. The Russian Federation indicated that it plans to leave the treaty. But uh, as the Biden administration, the uh, new administration uh, entered the White House, there is hope that the city would be saved. And then the Russian Federation keeps the door open. At least the formal process of uh, withdrawal has not yet started. Uh, but um, while we all hope that the city the, the treaty could be saved. Uh, we are also cognizant of the fact that uh, the treaty does have some challenges and there have been challenges in its implementation. Now, returning to the treaty it is not going to be easy. It's not can be done overnight uh, with just the indication of the desire to do so. And what um, this uh, webinar is prompted by is that maybe we could look, uh, have a broader look at the treaty and its provision and see how we can use this opportunity to discuss whether it could be modernized in its current format or whether the treaty and its uh, regime, particularly the transparency measures that are part of it, could be even extended further. Um, and I'm very delighted that uh, Dr. Jones, um, who just recently published his article on this issue, and we provided a link to it, and we'll provide it again in the chat, uh, agreed to speak to us today about uh, some of the ideas that he uh, put in his article and to modernize the treaty and to possibly expand it beyond its current both scope and geographical coverage. Um, I'm very delighted that uh, he agreed to uh, speak to us today. He's an associate professor in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. And prior to joining um, the university in 2007, he spent 14 years in the Canadian civil service, including seven years in the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, which is now called Global Affairs Canada, and seven years in the Privy Council Office, the Prime Minister's Department. And during that time, he was involved in issues of international security, arms control, and intelligence, including uh, in his capacity, he served on the Canadian delegations to the Ottawa, Budapest, and Vienna Open Skies conferences. Uh, so I'm very happy that we could have somebody who had practical experience working on the treaty, but also has spent some time as an academic looking beyond uh, the uh, uh, immediate kind of negotiations and implementation issues. Um, as always, uh, we will be welcoming you sending us questions through Q&A functions. Please use Q&A functions to post your questions. Don't use chat for that. Chat is for uh, issues that are related to uh, some technical problems or some other uh, relevant comments. We will also be posting if there are links uh, in the chat for all of you. Uh, in, uh, uh, for those of, who, uh, of you who is joining us on YouTube, please uh, send your questions to events at vcdnp. Dot .org. And with that, uh, I'm very happy to pass the microphone to our speaker today, Dr. Jones. 
Well, thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity. My thanks to the Vienna Center and to the James Martin Center. It's been a pleasure working with you. Um, the um, paper that I'm going to talk to today, and I'll start with the share screen here and, and put the slides up, um, is the product really of a set of discussions that I have been privileged to have over the last several months with a group of people who um, um, care about the treaty and are very interested in the future of the treaty. I thank them in the preface to the paper so you can see the names there and I appreciated all their inputs and insights and, and thoughts. And as we were having these discussions, which really began around the time the Trump administration announced its intention to withdraw, um, the idea occurred to us and, and was discussed by all of us of, you know, this is not just a moment to try and save the Open Skies Treaty, important though that is, and in fact, it's obviously the first priority of the work, but we should really think beyond it. I mean, the treaty has now been around with us for some time. And um, as is noted in this slide, the idea has really been around since 1955 uh, in one form or another, um, but it hasn't really changed very much since then. So obviously the world has changed a great deal since the treaty was signed in 1992 and even since it entered into force in 2002. <clears throat> so we need to reflect on, on how we might look ahead and, and what we might do to, uh, to modernize it. Um, since the treaty entered into force, there have been over 1,500 flights, the vast majority of which have happened completely without incident. Um, the, the underlying idea of the treaty is that it allows its members to make short notice short notice unarmed observation flights over one another. Uh, the data that results is shared. First of all, it's shared between the country doing the overflight and the country which uh, uh, received the overflight, but also a provision exists in the treaty for any other member of the treaty to request a copy of the data on a cost recovery basis. So it's there's a very wide pool of data that is shared here. Um, I'm often asked, well, what is the point of open skies? Now we're in an era of satellites and so on. Well, I mean, first of all, it can do things satellites can't do. It can get under clouds. These flights can, can uh, uh, remain in areas the way satellites can't. It's very expensive. Some satellites simply can't change their orbits. Others, it's extraordinarily expensive to do so. Open skies flights don't have that issue. Um, and especially for smaller countries who don't have their own national technical means, uh, they have, perhaps have access to commercial satellites, but they don't have their own means under their own control. It allows them to, to gather information and data on uh, events of interest and areas of interest uh, in a way that they control, which is something that is quite unique about this treaty. Um, it is a standalone CBM regime. It doesn't uh, formally link to any arms control treaty. Uh, as a verification mechanism. It doesn't formally link to any other organization, but there are, of course, in practice links, and these were welcomed in the treaty. If you read the preamble, it very much welcomes the idea that open skies flights would be used for verification and can be used in association with things like the um, OSCE and so on. So those are some, some background points uh, about the treaty as a whole. Now we should talk a bit about the issues that led to the withdrawal. And essentially there were three issues which the Trump administration put forward as being reasons for the withdrawal. And then there's a sort of a, a fourth issue that I include here. The first was the issue of Kaliningrad. This is a small area uh, of the Russian Federation, but which is separated from uh, the, the, the Russian Federation. It's on the Baltic. Um, and there has been problems with respect to flight distances over the Kaliningrad area. In 2014, a flight over Kaliningrad uh, was done in such a way as to play havoc with air traffic control and Russia imposed a restriction of 500 kilometers on such flights to prevent that happening again. And in response, other members protested. The United States imposed similar restrictions on Russian flights over Alaska and Hawaii. Um, so that is an issue. A, a second issue is what I would call uh, contested spaces. Um, when Open Skies was negotiated, when we were in Vienna and negotiating the treaty, um, the one thing we were quite certain of was that borders were sacrosanct. That was the one of the primary purposes of, of the Helsinki document of 1975. And so we knew that borders was not going to be an issue. Well, here we are some years later, and in fact, there are contested spaces. There are areas where borders are contested, Georgia, Ukraine, others. And so we need to think about whether or not we can find a way to, to conduct overflights in these areas. The, the Trump administration left the regime or said it left the regime because they charged Russia with using the open skies regime to try to 
get other countries to recognize their interpretation of borders in Georgia and Ukraine and so on. And that was, a, again, a reason why the Trump administration left. A third reason the Trump administration left was they charged that the Russians had uh, sort of weaponized the treaty and were using it for spying purposes and so on. And this was a very strange charge in, in the sense that the way the Russians were conducting their overflights, the way everybody conducts their overflights, was fully in accordance with the treaty. And in fact, was in accordance with the way that the United States and its allies had insisted the treaty be structured. When the treaty was under negotiation in the 80s and 90s, uh, it was Russia which tried to hold areas, or then Soviet Union, which tried to hold areas off limits and tried to say that you couldn't overfly certain areas. And it was the Western countries led by the US which said everything's subject to uh, overflights and there should be no areas off limits. So it was a very strange charge in that respect. Finally, although the Trump administration didn't say so, there are a sort of a background a sort of sense of this being a somewhat obsolete regime. Commercially available satellite imagery is available. Um, the, the, the questions of the aircraft and sensor packages. In some countries, they were becoming quite old. How would they be replaced? Uh, were the sensors the right ones for the job now? So these were a set of issues that were sort of lurking in the background, but they weren't the issues cited by the Trump administration for their withdrawal. So let's talk a bit about that withdrawal. Um, they announced, Trump announced the, uh, the administration announced the intention to withdrawal in May, uh, and the withdrawal became effective on November 22nd. Uh, my view is it was primarily ideologically motivated and groups of people in the administration who simply don't like multilateral arms control and multilateral co confidence building. Uh, I think that the uh, charges they made against open skies, uh, Kaliningrad and the contested spaces, they were real, they were genuine, but they were being discussed diplomatically and solutions were uh, slowly being developed. So I think it was primarily ideologically motivated. Others would disagree. Um, it was done in a rather interesting way in that Congress, uh, the Democratic controlled Congress, anticipating that the Trump administration might try to withdraw, inserted a section into the National Defense Authorization Act of 2020, uh, section 1234, easy to remember, which essentially required the administration to give Congress advance notice that it would intend to withdraw. So the treaty requires a state intending to withdraw to give six months notice to all the other parties which the Trump administration did, but section 1234 required the administration to give even more advance notice to Congress, which the Trump administration did not do. And in fact, disputed Congress's right to require that. So there is some dispute over whether the withdrawal was even done properly. That's another matter uh, that excites lawyers. We'll come back to it. Um, in response, Russia has announced that it intends to begin the process of withdrawal. It did that on the 15th of January, 2021, but it has not yet, with begun the formal treaty withdrawal process. And that's an important point because the formal process is that a country notifies the depositaries, which are uh, Canada and Hungary, and then a six month clock begins. Russia has not done that. So that's an important point to re um, um, recall. Um, with the election of the Biden administration, there is some hope that the United States will resume its membership of Open Skies, but that it will not be easy. So we'll talk a bit about that now. There are differences over the legal paths that are available to the Biden administration to re-enter the treaty. Um, there are a number of different uh, articles floating out there. International lawyers are quite excited about this. They like to write about these things. So one is one idea that's out there is to simply ignore the Trump withdrawal, to say that it was done in violation of the National Defense Authorization Act. It was not properly done. And therefore, we simply are going to ignore it and proceed and sort of notify everybody that we intend to re rejoin. And that would be the Biden administration. Uh, another is to argue that we can't ignore the Trump withdrawal, but we don't have to go back to the Senate for its advice and consent, because the treaty is exactly the same one now that the Senate approved when the United States first joined, and therefore that ratification exercise is still valid. Others say, no, we have to go for a full re-ratification. It has to be resubmitted to the Senate. Um, I won't go into detail over these. There are a variety of different arguments around each of them. Um, I think in the end, however, the point is it's going to be a political decision. Uh, the Biden administration is going to have to weigh the costs of the various options and, and its other priorities and, and it determine how much pain it wants to endure to get back into the treaty and who it wants to annoy. So it won't be easy, but it can be done. Uh, another issue is, of course, the U.S. Open Skies aircraft. When the Trump administration withdrew, it tried to scrap the aircraft immediately 
this was not done in the short time that um, the, the, the was remaining to the Trump administration. They're still there, but they're going to have to be replaced anyway. They're getting very old now. And it was recognized they were going to have to um, be replaced even if the United States remained in the treaty. Uh, and the good news is that we've had some indications publicly since the Biden administration uh, took office that there have been some discussions uh, and the Russians have been signaling that they're not going to begin the formal withdrawal process uh, if the United States re-enters the treaty. That seems to be the position now. So, so there is some hope in that respect. So let's talk a bit about the way ahead. Well, I think the key in the immediate uh, uh, term is to get the US back into the treaty and to prevent Russian departure. That's the, uh, the sort of the first order of business. And the paper argues that one way to do that, to sort of help with that process, which as I say, will not be necessarily an easy one in the US, is to fix the problems that led the Trump administration to withdraw to begin with. Because when the Trump administration announced its withdrawal, they sort of cited all these different problems and they said, well, if they're solved, we'll consider coming back. So if they're solved, uh, the, the opponents of the return to the treaty will have less to argue. They probably still will argue because they simply don't like it, but, but it would be a positive step forward. But looking beyond that, I mean, as I said, Open Skies was negotiated in a different era. Um, and that is not the case now. And so we need to think about, are there ways to extend the regime into these contested spaces, which didn't necessarily exist when we were negotiating it? Are there new sensors? Are there new missions? Um, that could be uh, given to open skies aircraft. So th that's sort of, I think, what we need to look at going forward. And, and should we consider broadening the concept and application uh, of the regime to different regions? So those are the issues that, um, that I think we need to look at. So in the paper, there's a set of proposals and they really are grouped into sort of three main sets of proposals. First of all, in the immediate term, even before the US necessarily would, rejoins the treaty, and to ease the way back in is a set of declarations to ease the way in for the US and to help prevent the Russian withdrawal. And I'll talk about those in a minute. And then in the more medium term, one to two years after the Americans rejoin the treaty, agreements should be negotiated, the paper proposes, uh, in the Open Skies Consultative Commission on these issues of contested spaces uh, and sensors to help really help the regime to keep pace with the last 20 years and to modernize it and, and make it more uh, uh, fit for its purpose today. And then in the longer term, um, three years plus, probably many more than three years, some exploratory decision, discussions to consider extending the regime to other regions uh, and, and to consider exploring sort of global applications of the open skies idea. Um, and I, I think that these discussions will likely be on a track two basis for some time. And I, I look here to the experience we had during the Cold War when groups like Pugwash and others sort of led a series of discussions over the years on different arms control concepts, different ideas, um, which officials weren't yet ready to join, but when the moment uh, sort of evolved, uh, they became the basis for some official discussion. So I think that would be a way to look forward to the longer term. So let me look at the first set of proposals in the immediate term. What I'm suggesting really here is um, a, a set of declaratory steps. Um, and, and we have some indication that in some ways the Kaliningrad issue was on its way to being resolved anyways. Just before the withdrawal, the Russians allowed a, an open skies flight to fly over 500 kilometers over Kaliningrad. And they did that deliberately and they announced it as a sort of a signal that this, this uh, issue was on its way to resolution. And I think that essentially the Russians dropping the 500 kilometer sublimit over Kaliningrad in return for some kind of a statement uh, that you know we recognize that open skies flights to the extent possible should not interfere with air traffic control and should be done in such a way as to not be an annoyance. Um, that, would, that would be a sort of, an, in my view, uh, uh, a good trade-off which would put this issue to bed. Um, on the Georgia issue, again, I think it can be quietly resolved through unilateral and declaratory steps. Um, the issue here is that uh, Russia ha has recognized the breakaway regions of Georgia, um, no other country has, and Russia has insisted that flights within 10 kilometers of its border with those breakaway regions should conform to the requirements of flights within 10 kilometers of the, of the border of a non-member state, which is in the treaty. And of course, no other member recognizes that or accepts it. And so that has led to a problem. 
With respect to the sort of spying and weaponization charges, uh, I, I'm not sure anything can be done about those because I don't think they were serious. I mean, I don't think they were, and they're not amenable to, to, um, to resolution. They were more ideologically motivated charges. Um, so I think all we can say is that the treaty is being uh, applied in exactly the manner that the US insisted it be applied when it was negotiated. And I think that issue needs to be, um, needs to be moved beyond. With respect to the second set of proposals, more the medium term, I think it's time for the regime to recognize that um, there are contested spaces now in, in the treaty application area. Obviously, this is an extraordinarily sensitive issue, and I don't make light of it. I mean, I suggest it could be uh, discussed within the next one to two years, but I, I'm completely aware that for larger political reasons, it's going to be a very sensitive issue because you know, countries which are in dispute over areas or over territories are going to be very leery of, of steps which they feel may give the other side an advantage or which may confer some legitimacy on the other side's claim. But the issue is though, that these are precisely the areas which probably most need to be overflown if the confidence building idea of the regime is to be, is to be at its most effective. These are the contested areas. And so what I propose in the treaty, in the, in the paper, excuse me, is that we look to the provisions of the Open Skies Treaty, which establishes a link between the Open Skies Treaty and the Conflict Prevention Center of the OSCE, and which also creates this phenomenon of extraordinary observation flights, which are flights that exist beyond the normal quota structure of the regime, which a country can request of itself if it wishes to have things made public or have things made known to the other treaty members. Those flights have been used. Ukraine requested such flights over, over itself uh, as a result of the crisis with Russia. And so I'm suggesting that we create a, a mechanism for the Conflict Prevention Center to fly over these contested spaces using aircraft from neutral countries, Sweden, for example. And, and these would not be flights that would be um, requested or, or conducted in accordance with the, the normal quota provisions and treaty provisions, but rather would be extraordinary flights and the data would be made available to all. So it would require essentially that the, the both countries claiming a contested area allow these flights to go forward on a non-prejudicial basis. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ambitious uh, proposal, but it's, it, the, the provisions for it do exist within the treaty and with some imagination could be made use of. The second of these sort of medium term proposals is to look at new sensors, upgrading the sensor packages and adding new types. And one type that's obvious is air sampling. Um, we talked about that in the negotiation of the treaty. It was decided not to allow it at that time, but there are mechanisms to allow these flights to acquire data, which could be very useful, for example, in the uh, nuclear test ban more a treaty in, uh, for environmental purposes. There's some debate over whether they'd be useful with respect to chemical and biological weapons. Some people say yes, some people say no, but, but um, anyway, the, the idea being that um, these new treaty, these new sensors could be added to the aircraft. Uh, they are commercially available. Um, the mechanism for adding them does exist. Um, and particularly within the treaty, which is rather interesting. And this, I remember it very well when we were negotiating the treaty, it was well recognized by the um, sensor experts that, you know, technology improves, things change. And so there would periodically be upgrades to the sensor packages of these aircraft. And it should not be required that every time that happens, um, there has to be a re-ratification by all of the member states. It can be done through an agreement within the Open Skies Consultative Commission. So the, the provision exists to upgrade and add new sensors um, within the treaty without having to re-ratify it. So that's a suggestion that I'm making here um, as a proposal um, in, the, in the medium term. In the longer term, uh, three years plus, and probably more than three years, um, really think about beginning to extend the open skies regime. And I, I propose two ways to do this. First of all, I think it's important that we begin to extend it beyond the um, um, area that it presently exists, which is the sort of uh, what's known as Vancouver to Vladivostok, um, and begin to take in some countries who are um, part of that area in a way, uh, and where there are significant tensions that need to be addressed, and countries that do not at this time uh, have not taken part in the kind of confidence building discussions which are uh, have been going on for many years in the European area. And so I propose China, Japan, and South Korea 
we begin thinking about bringing those countries in. Others have suggested we also bring in India and Pakistan. Uh, I think that's a perfectly reasonable suggestion. I don't think it's as viable for some reasons. I'd be happy to talk about that uh, in the chat. I think perhaps creating a, a, a sub-regional variant of open skies in South Asia would be a very good idea. But anyways, to begin thinking about bringing in countries like China, Japan, and South Korea, uh, first of all, because I think the treaty was very useful in those contexts, and secondly, because it would bring them into the, the discussion over confidence building, which, which needs to take place. And then finally, um, as this is going on, as discussions are going on about thinking about bringing these countries in, and, and I think, as I say, probably on a track two basis in the beginning to reach out to experts in these countries to discuss these ideas, um, to resume what was a very active consideration just after the treaty was signed of how to apply open skies in other contexts. And there were a number of papers written and studies done in the years after the treaty was signed on could you create a variant of open skies in the Middle East or South Asia or some other region. <clears throat> There's also been studies on, on whether or not open skies, even though it is limited to a certain area, the aircraft themselves uh, could not be made available to help with other global issues such as the environment. Um, perhaps future treaties on environmental issues will require some form of verification, some form of monitoring at least, um, and a suitably equipped open skies aircraft could be, could be made available for that. And so again, I'm proposing that, that that be done on a track two basis to begin with, that experts begin to meet and seriously consider these ideas uh, and, and, and uh, see what the issues would be and, and how that would have to be done. Um, I put these together in a chart, which appears at the end of the paper, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but essentially looking at, you know, um, what needs to be done, who would do it, what the timeframes would be, uh, and how it would be done. So, I mean, I was asked to speak for a relatively short period of time to allow the maximum for discussion. So, so I'll end it here. And my, my sort of final comment is I think we need to focus in the short term on what needs to be done to save the treaty. And clearly that is to get the United States back in and prevent the Russian withdrawal. And that should be the first order of business. And a series of things can be done to assist in that um, by the uh, other members of the regime. But beyond that, I think we also need to look ahead. I mean, uh, there's an old saying that I'm very fond of, which is that you should never let a good crisis go to waste. And this is a crisis for the regime. It is a crisis for the Open Skies Treaty. But I think the time has come to, to begin to think about how we can take advantage of this inflection point to, to consider ways to expand the regime, to enhance it, to modernize it, and perhaps to make it applicable in other regions. So I think I will stop there. I'll go back to this chart, which I think will be a basis for our discussion. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, very interesting and uh, very well uh, kind of summarized, concise proposals. And I'm sure that there will be reactions to that. Um, I'm just reminding for people to use uh, Q&A functions to function to post their questions and um, also sending uh, your questions through email at events at bcdnp.org. Uh, in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for people to post their questions, I do have a couple of questions. But maybe you will, uh, if you don't mind, spend a few minutes um, talking a little bit more about the chart that you left so conveniently on the screen. Because uh, I think that 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 would be very useful, um, particularly in terms of what I see the actions and methods and time frame. You touched upon them uh, when you described your proposals, but maybe will you will at least uh, give us a little bit me a little bit more walk through how do you propose some of these issues could be resolved? Or where, sure. yeah. Do you want me to do that now? Yeah. Yes. No. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, essentially the, the, there are six proposals. Um, and the first two are things that really need to be done by officials. They need to be done by governments essentially. Um, and I'm proposing that the way they're done, and this is Kaliningrad and Georgia, which are the two of the three reasons the Trump administration cited for leaving the regime. And I, I believe it's necessary to, to sort of fix these issues as a way of, 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 again, giving those in the United States and the Biden administration who wish to rejoin the treaty, giving them ammunition, just saying, look, you know, Trump said we're leaving because of these things. Well, they've been fixed now. 
Um, again, those who really wanted to leave the agreement for, for ideological purposes won't be impressed, but nevertheless, I think it's important to, to deal with these. So I think that on the Kaliningrad issue, for example, um, I think that, as I said a moment ago, some sort of a statement of understanding by everybody in the, in the regime, this can be done in the Open Skies Consultative Commission as a, a statement, that there's a, a, a recognition that these flights should not be a nuisance in terms of air traffic control, and they should be done in such a way as to uh, fulfill the objectives of the regime, but not interfere with normal air traffic. And in return for that, a statement by Russia that it essentially re removes the 500 kilometer restriction on flights over Kaliningrad. And that's something Russia unilaterally imposed it. Russia can unilaterally take it off. And as I say, there's some evidence they were going to do that anyway. Um, and then finally, a statement by all, including the US when it withdraws, when it rejoins, that they will remove similar restrictions. And particularly the Americans imposed restrictions on Russian flights over Alaska and Hawaii. And the time frame for that is immediate. And secondly, with respect to Georgia, again, it's official statements. Um, um, to remove the restrictions that each side has imposed as a result of this issue um, on a without prejudice basis, and that can be done immediately. Um, and then the third and fourth are a little more long term. I'm suggesting one to two years. It may well take more than that, but it's a suggestion. And again, there are things officials have to do. And the first is the broader question of contested spaces, these areas that are, are in dispute. Um, and here are the ideas for the, uh, the OSCE's Conflict Prevention Center to conduct these extraordinary observation flights, which again are allowed for in the treaty. They are specifically permitted in the treaty. There, there, there's a discussion of how they work uh, in the treaty um, and that they should be undertaken on a without prejudice basis with respect to the conflicting, conflicting claims. And again, the idea is to begin discussions within this consultative commission once the US is back in the treaty and try to achieve an agreement. I'm suggesting a year, it'll probably take a good deal longer than that, but nevertheless, it's, it's an important um, uh, proposal. Uh, and then new sensors, uh, again, this is something officials have to do, uh, develop an agreement for adoption by the OSCC. Again, new sensors and upgraded sensors don't require re-ratification of the treaty. They can be done internally to the treaty within the Open Skies Consultative Commission to add air, sam uh, air sampling sensors, other sensors, and to agree on the methodology for calibrating and certifying them. And that's an important part of this. When the sensors are agreed, they then have to go through a sort of a certification process so that when countries roll these new sensors out on their aircraft, they in fact do meet the provisions of the treaty. And so I'm suggesting that within one to two years, new sensors could be adopted and certified and, and flying. Uh, again, that may be ambitious. And then finally, the, the, the fifth and sixth uh, proposals. Um, and you know, this one, uh, uh, we'll stop here because okay. I think that there are questions related to, sure. to that, that we can. Uh, one question that I do want to pose that came uh, through email is, um, uh, what is the role of Europe in trying to uh, at least uh, uh, bring the US-Russia um, closer together in solving these issues? How do you see it? And, and then we'll talk about some of these regional issues and uh, the regional coverage. I mean, I, I think it's very important. I think the other treaty members have a significant role to play. Obviously, without the US and Russia, open skies will be enormously diminished as, a, as an agreement. But I, I think that the other countries of the, of the regime, and particularly, frankly, the larger European countries, they have signaled over the years that they do regard open skies as very important. They regard it as important for their own ability to collect information they find useful, but also as a sort of a transatlantic um, uh, confidence and security building measure, which, which um, um, is useful politically and some, to some extent symbolically. I think also, and this is something that often doesn't get discussed, particularly in the United States, I find is the sort of the smaller countries of the regime, they find it particularly useful as a means of gathering information that they simply could not otherwise gather. Um, and, and I think that they have a role to play. And, and when the uh, Trump administration announced its withdrawal in May of last year, Joe Biden made a statement, then candidate Joe Biden, in which he specifically said, I mean, you know, American leadership requires that we recognize the needs and desires of our allies and that we use these regimes to, 
to uh, assist them in achieving a greater degree of comfort about their neighborhood and what's going on. So I think, you know, reminding the United States of that and 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 the Russians of that and and working constructively within the Open Skies Consultative Commission to to sort of put forward bridging proposals, to put forward ideas, um, and to sort of help the diplomacy along in terms of these of these uh, ways in which the the treaty could be uh, preserved and and put forward. Okay, thank you. But just to, to clarify, uh, is Open Skies Consultative Commission is the only uh, body that exists with it uh, to, for any issues that rise up uh, or there are other mechanisms as well? Well, there are of course informal mechanisms and countries yeah. can talk to one another as they wish, but I mean, the Open Skies Consultative Commission is the body created by the treaty to, to manage and implement the treaty. And so it, it's required to meet regularly. Uh, issues of compliance come up before the OSCC. Uh, any discussion of sort of modernizing the censors or modernizing the treaty has to be agreed within the OS. It operates by consensus. Um, and so, I mean, it's the sort of the primary um, body established by the treaty to, to, to monitor and carry the treaty forward. So. Ultimately, I think you know countries can have discussions wherever they wish, and I suspect they probably will. And that might not be a bad idea because once you get into the OSCC, it's a sort of a, an official a discussion, and maybe it's better to have off-the-record discussions about some of these ideas in the first instance. But ultimately, they will have to go to the Open Skies Consultative Commission to be to be enacted, so to speak. Okay. Thank you. Then uh, going uh, to uh, the application to other areas and that issue, particularly with respect to China, Japan, South Korea, um, is certainly that uh, many of the uh, viewers um, also flagged uh, as of interest to hear more and uh, including some doubts that it will work particularly in India, Pakistan. Uh, but um, let me first kind of start with a question. If you were to um, start a conversation with, uh, say, a regional group, it may not necessarily be extending the Open Sky Treaty, but maybe creating something for that region, but with the similar goal. Uh, how would you uh, describe to these countries what kind of benefit, what kind of value an arrangement like that would bring to them? I think you'd look back to the original discussions which were put forward by President Eisenhower in 1955 and then by President Bush in 1989 and the discussions we had during the negotiations when there were many people who were very suspicious of this idea and, and regarded it as being unnecessary and intrusive. Um, and it took time to break down that resistance. And I think the point being that if you genuinely do not intend to threaten your neighbor, um, it's not enough to declare that. You have to be willing to show that you genuinely have no intent of threatening your neighbor. And one of the most dramatic ways to do that is to say, come over here and if you like, have a flight around, take pictures and determine whether you think or not um, we have that intention. And, and to sort of allay uh, suspicion and to create a, a mechanism whereby if a country feels that another country is, is potentially harboring ill intent, they can go and have a look for themselves. Now, people say, look, in the age of satellites, you know, we can do that anyway. Um, and that's a fair point, but it doesn't have that, um, uh, that element of a country overtly inviting others to come. I mean, you still control your own airspace. You may not control where the satellites go over, but you control your own airspace. And therefore allowing another country to come and have a look is, is an act of confidence building, which is, in some respects without parallel. And so obviously there'll be, you know, long discussions to be had <laughs> with these countries about whether they wish to do that or not, whether they've reached the stage where they wish they believe that that's in their interest. Uh, and we had long discussions with people who are now part of the Open Skies Treaty who didn't believe that that was in their interest um, and who were suspicious of the idea and so on. So this will not be quick, but it, I think it's important to begin these kinds of discussions. And I think the Open Skies Treaty provides a framework to do that, probably on an on unofficial level, at least in the first instance, with these countries. In terms of India-Pakistan, I, I, 
I do recognize the value of inviting them also to join. The problem is it begins to become rather big and unwieldy and you begin to get into questions about, you know, once you once a country joins the regime, it allows every other country to overfly in theory. There's a quota system. There's only so many flights per year, but in theory, any country can overfly any other country. Uh, and I, I'm not sure that a, a number of the existing countries would want India and Pakistan to overfly. I think it's probably better to have that as a sub-regional um, um, regime rather than uh, inviting them to join the existing regime. But that's a point for debate. Okay, thank you. We may still return to some of the regional applications because I, uh, I, I think uh, in other regions that also may serve as a, a like a beginning of the conversation. I'm thinking about the Middle East uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, free zone. And that's where the um, transparency and some kind of a, uh, ability to uh, uh, to um, observe the developments and the deployment would be um, useful. But that's also an area, and as with many other regions who are not used to having arms control agreement or transparency regimes in place, there is a deep suspicion towards the uh, uh, the collection of information, exactly that spying uh, um, concern. But um, I, I really like uh, a couple of questions that came to you through uh, Q&A is one is about um, using drones and including drones or other uh, uh, forms of contemporary remote surveillance mm -hmm. uh, into the treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your uh, opinion on that? I think technically it's obviously very feasible. Um, the sort of long distance endurance flights that some drones are capable of are only really uh, possessed by a few countries, but more generally, the idea is conceptually feasible. There is one element though that would need to be considered, which is that the idea of the treaty is that uh, it would require the military establishments of the countries involved to work together. So when these flights take happen, when these flights take place, um, you know, you give your notification of your intention to overfly another country, with, and so many hours later, your aircraft lands, it's inspected by the other side, and then you go off and do the flight. And during the flight, the, the observers from the country being overflown are on the aircraft. So you're all together, and they're observing you doing your overflight, and then you land, and the copies of the data are given to both sides, and there's an after-action report, and then you, you fly out. And all this is accomplished within certain specified periods of time according to the treaty. And so that really requires the military establishments to work together very closely to make these flights happen. And many people who are involved have said in many ways, that's one of the great benefits of open skies. It requires us to sit and work together in ways we don't normally do. And it becomes more normal and, and sort of almost routine for us to work together. I don't know how you'd accomplish that with drones. Um, but I mean, maybe that's something to be considered. The other thing is, of course, that the aircraft performing the overflight, when it lands, the country receiving the flight has the right to inspect the aircraft to make sure that the sensors on board are, are in compliance with the treaty requirements and so forth. And so uh, if your drone technology is particularly secret, you may not want it to be inspected uh, by, the, by the other country. So that would have to be something you'd have to consider. So in principle, mechanically speaking, technically speaking, there's no reason why drones couldn't be added into this, but thought would have to be given to how it would impact the sort of the cooperative confidence building aspect of, of doing these flights. Thank you. Um, there is a, a very interesting question uh, or observation also coming from one of the participants uh, where, um, uh, name is Thomas Hughes, who says that he gave a presentation about open skies to primarily military personnel and also uh, suggesting enhancing the treaty. But he received a considerable pushback on the basis that they felt that the treaty was being exploited by Russia for operational military benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, what, um, with that in mind, how can we bridge the gap between the diplomatic and security perspective of the treaty? And whether the perspective uh, that he had with this particular group 
is really something that is shared uh, by other military uh, because I, from what I understand, uh, some of the military actually see it's, a, it's extremely beneficial. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, your take on that, on that. Yeah, well, as you say, there are divergent views. I mean, I think that in countries which already have in many ways access to much of the data that open skies flights return, and you know, let's be frank, the US is one of them. Um, there's this sort of, why should we let the Russians come and overfly us and gather data when we can gather the data we want by other means? And that's, I mean, I think that's the question. Right? You know, that's the, the point that is made by some people who say that we're, we're allowing another country to come in and gather information on us that you know, we can gather that information without open skies or most of it anyway. Um, and that's a valid point as far as it goes, but it doesn't, it doesn't sort of address the confidence building aspect. And it doesn't address the idea that for America's allies and particularly its smaller allies, open skies is regarded as very useful and their militaries don't regard it as being particularly intrusive. I mean, they, they expect to have to give up this information to satellites anyway. So the ability for them to go and gather it with open skies flights is a benefit. And so, I think there's a, there's a cost benefit analysis and you, you correctly identify sort of military versus diplomat in some, in some countries, not all, but some countries. And I think there's a sort of a, the analysis from some quarters is we can get the information we need without open skies, why let someone else fly over us? That's a fair point. Uh, but I think the broader diplomatic question is because it's in our broader diplomatic interests to promote stability and confidence in this area where we have major security relationships and, and commitments, and where it is to our benefit that as many countries as possible feel more secure and more confident. And so, I mean, that's just a trade-off. I mean, I remember when we negotiated the treaty, it was very much the case that um, there was a debate within the intelligence community, particularly in the West and particularly in the United States, between two groups of people I used to call the collectors and the protectors. And the collectors were very keen on open skies. They could go and collect things with it. The protectors, the ones who have to protect our own secrets, they weren't so keen. And they argued that it was not uh, in America's benefit to, to allow these flights to happen. And that, that debate is still going on. And I think the, the question you had is a reflection of that. And so I would, I would simply say that there, there are going to be groups of people who are never going to be happy with open skies. They're not going to be happy for ideological reasons. They're not going to be happy because their particular area of responsibility, which is protecting secrets, is, is challenged by open skies. But countries have to make their decisions on the basis of much wider cost-benefit analyses, which take another, you know, a, a, a variety of viewpoints into mind. And I think for open skies, the, the broader cost-benefit analysis, in my view, I'm biased, obviously, comes down on, on the side of, the, the inconvenience and difficulty it presents is outweighed by the benefit it presents, particularly to America's allies. Okay, thank you. Peter, you know what we probably uh, should have uh, done it earlier is to stop sharing the slides so that you... Oh, okay. If we need to bring them back, we, we can do that. All right, there we are. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I see a couple of really good questions that I would like to pose to you. Uh, one of them uh, is related to, um, you mentioned the consideration of uh, including the environmental sampling. Uh, and uh, the question is particularly related uh, that something like that could be useful, say, for the Chemical Weapons Convention. And other issue, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on the environmental sampling uh, and what kind of uh, information it could gather and what it could be used for. Right. Um, well, it, it's a very interesting area. My, my friend Hartwig Spitzer in Germany has done a lot of work on this, published a number of papers on it, as have others. Um, there's a couple of issues here. Um, first of all, there's some dispute over whether what would be gathered by Open Skies Flight would be useful for CBW, for chemical and biological weapons. People say, you know, the traces that might be picked up of violations are so small um, that it's, it's, it's not viable. There, there seems to be a, a general measure of agreement that open skies flights could be useful in helping to verify a test ban treaty, for example, because what would be picked up in the environment of a, if a surreptitious test happened um, is more uh, identifiable. 
So the, in terms of arms control, the, the sort of the, the benefit of aerial sampling is, is under discussion. Um, um, in terms of the broader question of the environment, I mean, open skies flights have already been used for environmental monitoring, um, both in the United States and in Europe, flights have been used, open skies aircraft have been used to monitor damage after major storms and after floods. I mean, that's already happened. So the idea of using the, even the existing sensors for environmental purposes is, is, is out there and is happening. But there's a broader question, of course, of, of if we are going to get into agreements on um, um, pollution and, and, you know, as we already have, and on sort of trying to monitor the environment, um, is there a role for commercial, app, uh, commercially available sensors on open skies flights to help do this? I would say that if you're creating open skies specifically for environmental purposes, it's probably not economically viable in the sense that other platforms can do this, uh, commercially available platform. But if the aircraft exist anyway, and if they're flying anyway for the purposes of confidence building, then adding the aerial samplers is, is not that significant, at least in terms of the information I've seen in the studies I've done, it's not that significant additional a cost. And it would bring whole groups of new users into the open skies world. Uh, you know, the open skies has been really the province and the, 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 the possession of the military establishments in the different countries um, in which it exists. And that's, that's reasonable. It's, it, that's why it was negotiated. But I think if, if those charged with monitoring the environment and the health of the environment and, and, and monitoring, you know, compliance perhaps in future with, with uh, environmental treaties learned that there was this ability to really gather very sensitive data on the environment throughout the entire Northern Hemisphere, um, they might be quite interested. And, and moreover, if agreement could be reached that these aircraft, while they would be in the possession of the countries concerned and they would be primarily used for the open skies flights under the treaty, they could also be made available to an international organization which was charged with monitoring the environment. I mean, that could be another use for the aircraft which would justify the cost of them and, and make the, um, make the regime more viable. So, I mean, these are all issues which need to be addressed and discussed and considered in negotiation and so forth. But I think there's enough data out there from the studies that have already been done to suggest that there are some roles and that it's worth looking into. Thank you. I, I see a lot of comments in, in the questions about some of the sensors available through OPCW and for CTBTO, so that there is something to <clears throat> really explore and look there. <clears throat> but the question that I want to um, uh, ask you is, um, one of the our uh, viewers asks that, what is this TKR situation in your view? Biden bypassing the Senate through the loophole in uh, NNDA section one, two, three, four, to get the US back in the treaty or risk losing Russia because the Senate won't cooperate and why? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I have some friends who are international legal scholars who are quite excited by what's going on with open skies. They're enjoying it enormously as a sort of a test case of, of, uh, of, of how to approach this sort of situation because I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in US law, but I mean, the US, um, Constitution is rather silent on the matter of how you rejoin a treaty, how you withdraw from a treaty. Um, it, it specifies how the US joins a treaty. And so there's uh, a number of questions about, you know, what are the powers of the president to unilaterally withdraw the country from an agreement which the Senate has ratified? Is, is the Senate not required to be a, a consulted on the matter? Um, and there's no real answer to that. I mean, the uh, Trump administration had its Justice Department issue an advisory that, of course, the power of the president is absolute. Of course, they would say that. Uh, there are others who say that that's, that, that should be tested in court. Um, I mean, as I said in my presentation, with respect to open skies per se, I think it's going to be primarily a political decision, um, but it's going to be one that's going to set some precedents. And that's why people are going to watch it very, very closely in terms of whether the Biden administration chooses to um, and as I say, from, from my sort of reading of the different um, um, legal articles and opinions that are out there, 
um, there are essentially three options, but they're variations of each of them. There are, there are dozens of op options in terms of how this might play out. But the one is to say that the, the, the withdrawal was not valid because this section of the National Defense Authorization Act was not adhered to. Um, a number of people, I think, initially thought that might work. Others are now beginning to say, you know, it, it was a withdrawal. It has to be dealt with as such. And then there's this idea of simply saying, look, the treaty hasn't changed since the Senate gave its advice and consent many years ago. That advice and consent is still, is still valid. Um, I think the most difficult for the treaty, maybe the one that the Biden administration will choose for political reasons, but the most difficult for the treaty would be to try and get the full two thirds of the Senate to re-ratify it. That would open things up and uh, individual senators would start requesting changes and things like that. I think that would be a very different, and I think that would be um, in many respects a signal to the Russians that this may not work. Um, so that's my sort of um, non-lawyerish uh, political science <laughs> diplomatic um, answer to your question. I think ultimately it'll be a decision that the Biden administration will have to make based upon a cost benefit analysis of how, of how useful Open Skies is to them and how much their capital they're gonna invest in it. And that's why I say that, you know, resolving some of these issues like Kaliningrad and Georgia and showing that the reasons why the Trump administration said it was leaving have been resolved now. I mean, that could be something that the Biden administration could use in the sort of internal fights in Washington to say, he said he'd go back if these issues were solved, they've been solved. You can't solve, of course, the charge of spying, but I don't think that was ever meant to be solved. That's not a solvable issue. That's more of a um, uh, ideological and, and 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 so forth. So, I mean, I think that's that's the reason why I would I would favor a kind of a declaratory approach, and 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 giving the Biden administration as much ammunition as it has for this internal political legal argument it's going to have. Okay, but <clears throat> thank you, but. Uh... You already started with talking about this, uh, about Georgia and about Kaliningrad, but uh, in terms of uh, um, signaling uh, how it should be done uh, or what would be helpful, what is in your view, like what needs to come first? Uh, the Biden administration is like who wins first and who makes concession first? Or what kind of signaling would be the most useful from the Russian side? to help the Biden administration to, to deal with the problem in hand. Yeah, I mean, obviously that gets into the sort of the, the, the tactics of diplomacy and as you say, who blinks first and all this sort of thing. I mean, I think that it would be helpful to try to the extent it's possible. And I know that in the real world, it's never entirely possible, but to the extent it's possible to try and separate this out from a kind of a who blinks first and who wins what. Um, I think if both sides take the view that the the objective is to try and save the treaty, then, then it becomes more a question of sort of what I sometimes call reciprocal unilateralism, sort of a set of things that each side does unilaterally, but on the basis of a, of a kind of a, an understanding of that they'll be reciprocal. And I think in that respect, you know, the Biden administration could signal that in the, the order in which these steps will be taken will be a, a different matter. But, you know, once it has rejoined the treaty, that if the Kaliningrad issue is gone, there'll be the, the issue of Alaska and Hawaii will be gone also. I mean, that's that's gone, it's done. You know? And again, these were unilaterally imposed restrictions. They can be taken off unilaterally. I think that would help Russia quite a bit. Um, I think that in return, as I said, Russia had already before the US left the treaty allowed a flight involving an American aircraft to go more than 500 kilometers over Kaliningrad. They did it in the summer. Um, and, they, and they issued a press release to that effect when it was happening. I mean, they said, look at this, you know. Um, so they were already signaling that that may well be over. And so I think that that's something that can be done. I think that maybe the first mover in that might be the other members of the regime, uh, not the US, not Russia, but the other members to issue this sort of statement that I have suggested through the OSCC, simply saying that they recognize that the purpose of these overflights is not to harass air traffic control. And it's not to interfere with the normal operation of civilian uh, uh, air traffic control. And therefore they recognize that um, in, in preparing these flight plans, they should at least be cognizant of ways in which they can avoid 
creating difficulties for civilian air traffic control. I mean, the treaty does say very clearly in its uh, in its body that that these overflights take precedence over everything else. If an overflight is going through an area of heavy civilian traffic, that traffic has to be stopped um, because of the security and confidence building imperative was regarded as the most important. And I wouldn't suggest removing that. I think that still should be there. It should be important in times of crisis, it's necessary. But I think a corollary of that could be a statement that, but yes, but in, you know, we recognize that there's no need and there's no desire to, to um, to annoy and harass air traffic control. So, I mean, the, the point was that in 2014, a flight went over Kaliningrad and it essentially flew what some people called a lawnmower pattern, up and down, up and down, up and down. And it played havoc with, with the region. And that's why the Russians imposed this restriction. So, so I think we can get over that. And maybe that's the first step in a sort of unlocking this logjam. Well, thank you. It seems like indeed a very good proposal coming from you. and. Uh, uh, I hope uh, some of the uh, European partners are also taking note uh, of a uh, possible way to start that process. And um, I want to um, apologize to everyone who also posted questions, some really good questions, some more technical and some a lot of interesting proposals, as I mentioned to about use of these uh, uh, transparency and confidence building measures for, um, inter for other areas or intersection with other regimes. I apologize that we won't, did not have time to address all of them, but I thought that was a very interesting uh, discussion and thank you for, um, first of all, uh, to uh, for generating some of these ideas, thinking them through and and also having a very simulating uh, um, discussion today. I think that it was, uh, I learned a lot. I'm not <laughs> normally in our uh, work of line at the VCDNP, we focus more on nuclear issues, but uh, given uh, that we're here in Vienna and it's arms control is in a, have been at least for, in trouble for a number of years. Um, that uh, I think it's it's uh, very interesting to see how uh, some of the problems um, are uh, basically translating from one area that they're not limited to one particular area, they're more across the board, but also it's to see opportunities, how maybe progress in one of the areas could lead to the progress in other areas. Uh, we saw um, at least a very quick and rapid um, uh, uh, extension of the start, new start treaty, and hopefully that sets a path for also uh, solving the open skies um, conundrum at the moment. At least uh, I'm sure the majority of us who are joined today uh, wish that that is the case. Um, and um, thanks again, Dr. Jones, for uh, joining us and for um, very, very interesting proposals that I'm sure will generate con continuing discussions. Um, Thank you for having me. Those who are interested in the treaty. With that, uh, we're closing our webinar and I'm wishing everyone a very nice day and uh, stay safe and healthy.